Uh, you know, I love this part of my job, where I get to welcome you to events like this. And, uh, and so it is uh, with great pleasure that I, that I welcome you to the inaugural Hayes Symposium, Living Through, Living Through Death. And although it, my job right now is just to welcome you, not to do the introductions, but I can't go any further. I can't say another word without introducing the man in whose name this symposium is, uh, is, is, is named, and that's Archbishop James M. Hayes, who's in the front row here. It's, uh, it's just wonderful to have Archbishop Hayes with us this evening. We are all in for an interesting and important time this evening. Death, dying, and bereavement, in my mind, are fundamental human experiences. And our attitudes towards them shape human systems, societies, and institutions. Deeply engaging in the questions that surround these experiences are of vital importance to our world. And not to speak for the Archbishop, but I would say that uh, uh, of anyone, Archbishop Hayes knows that the engagement that we will enter into tonight and the engagement around these issues of dying, death, and bereavement need to be based in both intellectual rigor and practical application. A faith leader, a pioneer in palliative care in this region, and a founder of the Atlantic School of Theology, Archbishop Hayes has done just a tremendous amount to, to advance our understanding of and practice surrounding issues of dying, death, and bereavement. I was ordained as an Anglican priest in 2004 directly into hospital chaplaincy. And very quickly I became aware of the legend and legacy of Archbishop James Hayes. On the hospital units and in the in the patient rooms uh, where I found myself, people spoke of, of uh, Archbishop Hayes with great respect for his compassion and leadership. And then when I started as president of Atlantic School of Theology not quite a year ago, I learned much more about his commitment to ecumenism and his work to help create a theological university which explores, which lives out and celebrates community in diversity. Today, as a direct result of Archbishop Hayes' effort, AST is in its fifth decade of shaping leaders and understanding among communities of faith. And, and as, I re as I reflect on what I know about Archbishop Hayes, what he stands for and what he's worked towards, for me there is, there's one simple and powerful theme that emerges, and that is a recognition of our common humanity. An understanding that theology in its highest form transcends what divides us and brings us closer to each other and closer to the divine. So it's fitting in my, in my mind that this symposium is in celebration of Archbishop Hayes, his life's continuing work and what you continue to teach us because there is never a more important time to be connected than when dying, death, and bereavement are profoundly impacting upon our lives. We all, we all know well, I suspect, the demographics that are pressing these issues upon us, an aging population, an imbalance in the number of, of young people and the number of old people in Canadian society. But the numbers, the statistics, are really just a colorless representation of the spiritual realities of dying, death, bereavement, and hope. These experiences, how we frame them and how we understand them are incredibly important to our collective spiritual journey as a society. And today's symposium is an important step in stimulating and continuing an important dialogue about the issues. One little plug, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that as part of the larger vision of a James M. Hayes Center for Pastoral Care and Pastoral Theology, we are working to create an endowed chair in pastoral care at AST. So uh, our, our Hayes Scholar will conduct and support research projects and will contrib contribute to this being an annual symposium. And so please keep that in mind. And if you are in a position to support this important endeavor, endeavor or you know somebody who may be in that kind of position, please do let us know. 
And I'm going to wrap it up now. You didn't come to hear me. Uh, but I do want to express my gratitude to our speakers and presenters over, the, over this week. We're very grateful to you all. Thank you to the members, too, of the Symposium Organizing Committee, Susan Chisholm, Jody Clark, Nula Kenny, Marianne Martin, and Beverly Musgrave. Uh, and, and, and most of all, our sincere gratitude to Archbishop Hayes uh, for allowing us the honor of, on of honoring you in this way. And finally, thank you for being here this evening. I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I know you're in for uh, a, really, uh, a really amazing time. Thank you. Okay. So three really quick things. Uh, is, is Phil Cooper here? Is, is Phil here? Thank you. Okay, because we have your keys to your room if you're, if you need. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> if he shows up, he's, we've got keys. If not, come and see me anyway. I've got keys to a room. So... <laughs> That's the first thing. Over here to my right is a sacred table, and uh, tomorrow we'll be lighting the candle. And if by chance tonight, as you're leaving, uh, and you feel moved to um, put a name or a thought or something that you would like prayerfully held by us over the days of the symposium, um, please feel free to do that. This is a sacred enterprise, and so we want to honor that reality as well. So please feel free to do that. Um, the next thing I have to do is introduce uh, our guest speaker tonight, the, most, the best Introductions are the shortest introductions, oh, right? Because you want to hear her. Um, there's a write-up about her. If you want to know more, she's extraordinary. She's uh, Sister Charity. She is a physician, pediatrician, ethicist. She holds more honorary doc doctoral degrees than universities in Canada or Nova Scotia. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, she holds countless degrees, written 180 articles, six books, three books. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 three books right now, but we've been, she's on this committee, and she's already written about three other books, right, outlined at least three other books, not kidding, okay, now this is what I want to say about Nula, because you can read about her, uh, years ago, I went to Niagara Falls, I don't know if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, and um, I, I went there at night, and I stood beside this rushing water, right, this torrent of water, just as it's about to pass over the precipice into the falls area, um, and I had this awe feeling, of being in the presence of something quite extraordinary, kind of a, a, a freak of nature. The only other time I've had that experience is in a meeting with Nula Kenny. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sister Dr. Nula Kenny, welcome. <laughs> no pressure. I have been called many things, Jody, but never a freak of nature. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm extremely honored uh, to be here tonight uh, to be giving the inaugural Hayes Lecture at the Atlantic School of Theology. And I want to say... Uh, I truly believe that there are no accidents. I think it's no accident at all that Dr. O'Brien, how many years ago, three, started to think about uh, doing something to honor Archbishop Hayes and his commitment particularly to the care of the sick, dying, and bereaved. But talk about timely. I will be speaking tonight and again tomorrow morning about the fact that Canada, in less than three weeks, will put into full effect what has been legal since February 6, 2015, in physician-assisted death. Not dying. Well, well, I'll tell you why. Physician-assisted death. But can you imagine that something that started a number of years ago would actually come into effect within weeks of a paradigm shift in care of the dying in Canada and in care of the dying by physicians. So there's two things I want to say to you. The first is that I'm really happy to be here because it's AST. And one of the things that Bishop Hayes got me to do over my lifetime, he's asked me to do many things, is would I participate in the board of the Atlantic School of Theology? This is when I was young and foolish. Now I'm only one of those things. 
And it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I subsequently became chair of the board of ASG, so I'm proud for that. But I'm even more proud to be honoring uh, my dear friend, Archbishop James Martin Hayes. And I want to just tell you briefly, um, I mean, there are things I can't tell you that I've learned from him, but what I can tell you is very powerful. Two enormously important things. First, Archbishop Hayes became the Archbishop of Halifax the year I took my vows as a Sister of Charity of Halifax. And my religious formation for the last two years in what we called the Junior Right House out at the Mount St. Vincent campus was led by his cousin, Sister Romaine Bates. Archbishop Hayes is now one of the three living English-speaking Canadian Fathers of the Council. I think there are two in a Francophone. So we were imbued from the very beginning of my religious formation with the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. Liturgical renewal, ecumenism, I mean, it was a fabulous time to be a Catholic Christian in the developed world. So the first thing I want to say is I learned in his fervor and commitment to liturgy about the need for us to do things together. And you'll see how that will come through uh, this evening and even more powerfully tomorrow morning. But I want to read you something he wrote in Celebrate, the liturgical journal that used to be around here in Canada. In 1993, To me, spending time with a dying person is like the experience of spending time before the Blessed Sacrament, which is, you know, for Roman Catholics in particular is precious. It's like spending time before the Blessed Sacrament. Sometimes we may talk. Most of the time, we are just there, but the presence means something. So I learned from Bishop Hayes as a doctor, as a fixer, if it's broke, give it to Nula, she'll make it all better, and she loved doing it with kids, that those things are important, but that presence being with, attentively being with and listening is the most important duty and obligation in caring for the sick and the dying. And for that, I am eternally grateful. But I want you to know that Bishop Hayes, and many of you in the room, maybe most, all come from a particular world And that world, and I'm going to use particularly the Middle Ages expression, knew the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. Now, just to put this in context, the Ars Moriendi was written about by Christian scholars at the time of the bubonic plague. If any of you remember history, somewhere between 40 and 50% of Europe at the time was decimated in, in less than two and a half years. I mean, could, could you imagine this? I mean, if we could just imagine, you know, the inferno that's going through Fort McMurray. Th this was a, a, an inferno of another kind, an infectious one with far more devastation of life. But watching that fire gives you a sense of nothing is left behind the same. So the Ars Moriende were, uh, were writings about how to deal with the dying process, especially when so much dying was around you. And particularly in light of the fact that so many people were dying, that there was no possibility that a priest could be there at the end. So it was the question of how do we prepare the community? One of the things you need to know about ours, art translated, is that it generally refers to skill or technique. But in actual fact, there are two different things that we might be thinking about when we think of an ars moriendi, an art of dying. 
And you see now where I'm going. I'm going to ask, do we have an art of dying, not for the medieval period, but for 21st century Canada? And you need to know that the art, Ours might refer to an artist. That's what you usually think of when you think of art. You think of a beautiful finished project on the wall, capturing in sensate form beauty. But ours also refers to craftsmen, those folks who carve things, cabinet makers, make the box go in and out, the slide, the craft. The craft seems much more humble, almost amateur, but the craft is constantly being learned, constantly being shaped and formed as it forms and shapes. I'm going to suggest, as has recently been suggested to me, that those who assist the dying are practicing ars moriende in the sense of a craft, a craft that requires that we work together, a craft that requires physicality, embodiment, learning, listening, shaping, and being reshaped. I'm also going to refer to the notion of ours as artist and make this claim. In that period, there was also a linking of ars moriendi and ars vivende, the art of dying and the art of living. That, in fact, we were preparing every day of our life for our death and conversely, if we were not preparing for our death, we could not live fully. Death is our final work of art in this notion. So Archbishop Hayes comes from a worldview where, in fact, the Christian worldview, as we entered into the 20th century, had been shared and shaped a bit, but basically it was an enduring one. And for Christians, for Christians, th these characteristics were clear. When responding to birth and death, early medieval Christians lean heavily upon two fundamental features of their culture. So now capture the notion of culture and how culture is important in shaping how we do the craft and what the craft is for. First feature the centrality of birth, death, and resurrection in their faith. These things were central. Second, the importance of families in their mental horizon and social organization. Now, because these things were central, the practices of dying and the practices of care for the dying became crucially important. Dying was normal and natural. It occurred in the home and in the community. Now, when I say that, I want you to be really clear. I'm not talking some romantic notion of grandma in the back room of the farm dying elegantly. I'm saying because dying was normal and natural and it occurred in the home and the community, it was very physical as well as emotional and spiritual. My friend Harvey Chachinoff, I said to the rabbi earlier, my two favorite people writing in palliative care, I'll get to this tomorrow, are good Jewish boys. But my friend Harvey Chachinoff says, we need to be attentive to what he calls the intimate dependencies of care of the sick and dying. In, in other words, what he's asking us, Harvey's asking us to consider is what the medievals, the, the, before we in fact professionalized and hospitalized care, people knew this was not just about the emotional, spiritual, but it, you got your hands dirty. It was participating in responding to need because it was there. So it was an embodied response to the care of the dying. But then look at the corollary. In the monasteries, the cura anime, the healing of the soul through Christian worship and learning, and the cura corporis, the healing of the body, went hand in hand. Hold, this, hold these two concepts as we start on the journey I'm going to take you through. Because one says 
Dying was normal and natural, and families and intimate others and loved ones were essential in the care. The other says the care of the body and the care of the soul were inextricably connected. This is pre-Cartesian dualism, and yet it, f it was the foundation for the way in which, slightly differently in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but definitely in the Christian tradition as well, th this is how dying occurred. It was normal and natural, and the community surrounding the dying person was essential. This is the tradition to which I belong. I'm a Roman Catholic nun and a doctor. Hospitals, the modern hospital, that this, this is the precursor to the modern hospital. Do you know that? And in fact, if we could have taken a picture in the Halifax Infirmary in 1952, with their old big black, no, the white habits for the nursing sisters, the sisters in administration had the black, would have looked very much like this. <laughs> and it would have been, now we're talking 700 years later. But I need you to hold on to this notion, that the modern hospital, the, and the forerunner of the modern hospital, incorporated the notion that care of the body, care of the soul were one. They had to. But what now was necessary, where there are places where the dying and the care could not occur in the home, and therefore there were places where the larger community of care responded. I'm referring to this as the way we were. Because Archbishop Hayes comes from the way we were. All of this was normal and natural to him. And let me read this quote. Because we're now going to move from the way we were to the way we are. The way we were. Those closest to the patient ministered in a variety of ways, watching and praying with the patient, listening and talking, laughing and weeping. In solidarity, hold that one. In solidarity, a close community bore the painful experience together the way we were. Today, death is regarded as a failure of medical science. The dying find, all too frequently, themselves isolated from human warmth and compassion in institutions, cut off from access to human presence by technology, which dominates the institutional settings in which most deaths occur. was in solidarity. The care was everything from laughing and telling a story about Nana when she burnt the pie to being there together to hold each other in support as dying occurred. And remembering, remembering, remembering who that person is and what they had done for us. Today, In February of last year, the Supreme Court of Canada decriminalized physician-assisted death for a certain group of patients. So decriminalized, no longer criminal, made legal. Assisted death has been legal in this country since February 6th of last year. There was a stay originally for one year extended to 16 months that is ceases on January, uh, June 7th of this year, to work out the legislation and the regulation. But this is the key decision. It decriminalized physician-assisted death for competent adults with a grievous medical condition, including an illness, dis disease, or disability. No definition of grievous. By the way, Catholics in the room, I'm sorry, I don't know if this particular uh, prayer is said in, in other Christian settings, but for the Catholics in the room, we're the only people in modern times who use the word grievous. Huh? In the confidior before mass, 
through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Nobody else knows what the heck the word means. And you need to understand, I mean, there may be some other religious traditions, but in, in general, I've just my experience is nobody ever uses that word. And throughout all of the regulation exercises, nobody's defining it. More importantly, for a grievous medical condition, it means serious. Lawyer told me the legal definition is non-trivial. Whoa. This is in the, the, what's in parentheses is in the decision. These are called the Carter criteria, including an illness, disease, or disability. Please get this very, very clear. For whatever you think a physician assisted death, and I hope by the end of my time, I'll get you to rethink what you think. People's moral imagination has been individuals dying in intractable physical pain, and that they should be the ones allowed to end their life. That is not what the Supreme Court decision is about. It had nothing to do with terminal illness or dying. Nothing, not a zip. Second, competent adults with a grievous medical condition that is irremediable, according to the, to the patient, even if the patient never tries any of the proposed remedies. And then finally, and this is going to be the topic that I want us to be particularly attentive to, that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the circumstances of his or her condition. Please understand, when you hear Nula talk through the rest of this time together about the medicalization of suffering and the technological response to suffering, Nula's not making this up. It's the wording in the Supreme Court decision. The focus is about suffering. And I want us to then deeply, deeply think of the nature of suffering. So, I want to explore now part one, tomorrow morning will be part two, of what I call the paradox of our time. As I see it, on the one hand, we wish to avoid death at all cost in Canada. In fact, those who were here for the afternoon session watching the phenomenally powerful movie Wit saw it's difficult to die in a hospital because they're going to thump and jump on you with electric panels whether you want it or not. And that was the huge, huge, disrespectful, disgraceful, painful experience uh, in, in the, of the patient that we saw in the movie today. But we want to avoid death at any cost. And we believe technology is the answer. Nula, I was chief of the Children's Hospital for eight years. Many of you may know that. Uh, Dr. Kenny, no, 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 no. If you can't, if there's nothing that you can do here, send us to sick kids. Well, before I came here, I was at sick kids for six years. At sick kids, well, Dr. Kenny, if they can't do it at the hospital for sick children, we're going to Philadelphia Children's. Or worse, no, no, they have an experimental treatment in Mexico. On the one hand, and this is the theme for tonight, tonight we're going to think about dying. Not the way it was, but the way it is, and how the way we think of dying and experience it in modern healthcare then shapes our approach and attitude to suffering. So on the one hand, we've got this paradox. Avoid death at all costs. Technology has the answer. Oh, just a, I love this one. Nula, my father died because the ambulance did not get there in time. Okay, you can laugh whenever you want. Are you not stunned by that comment? Did you, did you not hear what I just said? My father died because the ambulance did not get here in time. When we say that kind of thing, what are we talking about? What, what, what is the mindset? So, so tonight, part one, I want to look at this part of the paradox. Technology seen as the answer in a death-defying world. So not only are we humans that are death-denying, which is a natural tendency for humankind, but now we're death-defying. And tomorrow morning, my second lecture, 
is going to take the second part of the paradox. So one, avoid death at all costs. Technology can fix it. You can go on living forever if you want. Two, paradox two, choose death. It's my choice. It's my right to choose death, and I choose it as a treatment, and I choose it as a treatment for human suffering. Uh, wait a minute. On the one hand, we want to avoid death. On the other, we want to choose it. And we want to choose it first as a treatment. I'll say this again tomorrow in a little more detail, but for those of you who won't be there. Uh, philosophically, a treatment presumes a patient who receives the treatment and is well and benefits after the treatment. This is not a treatment. <laughs> Moreover, it's, it's a treatment for suffering, and we're going to see that particularly tomorrow when we're going to look at the actual reasons people request assisted death. So tonight, avoid death at all costs. Technology has the answer. I've said more than once, when I finished my time as chief of the children's, I remember the first time I said this, I think more people in North America believe in technology than believe in God. And I will stand by that. So this is my question for the next little while together. How did we get here from there? <laughs> How did we get from a worldview of the normal and natural with community being essentially important, with clear understanding that there was both treatment of the body and treatment of the soul, to where we are with a Supreme Court decision that's absolutely founded on individual rights. That's what it is. It's a charter challenge to individual rights and freedoms. No, no, no acknowledging the importance of the common good. And one where death is a choice but it's not just respect for the autonomy of a patient because doctors are obliged to respond. Why my colleagues in medicine have responded is still a great heartache for me. But how did we get from normal and natural, understanding there's both body and soul, to the whole thing is now professionalized and medicalized and technology is still the answer. So you do realize that when I entered medical school in 1967, I was 10 years old. <laughs> I had to give you the year, so I thought I'd... I want you to see two things that are themselves the embodiment of the contradiction and experience we face today. So I entered Dalhousie Medical School in 1967. That, that, the Tupper Building was the Centennial Project. Remember? Dr. Safton remembers. You remember that, right? So. I want you to know that in September, here I am, I'm a sister, I'm a, a nun, given this extraordinary permission to do medicine. I live with the sisters at the Halifax Infirmary who are beyond fabulous in supporting me. I go with this notion, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm gonna, medicine is a calling. It's yet, an, I have a, a calling uh, as a baptized person. I have a calling as a, Roman Catholic sister, and now I've got a calling as a doctor. Woohoo! Triple threat! God is good to me! <laughs> but I enter a world of medicine where, in fact, most of the gang that entered medical school with me, they didn't say it exactly the same way I did. One nun in the class, my God, that first week was lonely. It's okay, by the end of medical school, I'm a life officer, but by the, in the first week, they, they, who are these people? They generally did have a sense. They were gonna make a good living, but they didn't enter medicine for the money. They entered medicine, it's like 1967, that's how short a time ago we were all the way we were. They entered because this was a way they could use their talent and ability in healing the sick. I mean, it was this, what a wonderful thing if I could do it. So now hold with me. I go in with this notion of the spiritual, with this notion of the call into medical school. September 1967, worldwide headlines. So subsequently, Time Magazine. This is Christian Barnard. The first successful heart transplant in the world. The month I start my medical school. Okay, hold on, hold on. Same month. Who's that? That's Dame Cecily Saunders. 
the phenomenal Anglo um, Anglican in the United Kingdom who in the same month officially opened St. Christopher's Hospice. So I notice headlines around the world. I never heard about Dame Cecily for my four years of medicine and my four years of residency. Nothing. Interesting, huh? Interesting. So, how did we get from there to here? Step by step. So let me take you step by step to see how did this happen. Because I'm going to suggest the, you know the little story of the lobster? If you cook them the wrong way and you put them into the cold water and they're there, woohoo, this is fun. Warm it up a little bit. Oh, this is nice. This is a little bit of a sauna. Warm it up even more. These guys go unconscious and then they're dead. And they didn't even know it was coming. Step by step. Step by step. I want you to know that our culture has become death-denying and death-defying, and we now conflate all technology with the, its life-saving potential and have failed to understand technology's death-prolonging potential. I mean, if I get you confused, stick with me. I'll clear it up. Okay, Death-prolonging. Moreover, we're going to see in a minute that we got here because there were unprecedented medical advances that occurred in less than a decade, the decade right around the period of just a few years before I started medical school and then before the end of the 60s. Unprecedented medical advances that transformed what we think of dying and how people die, and more importantly, transformed the definition of death, dead, pronouncer dead. Well, wait a minute now. Let's see what that looks like, but unprecedented. Moreover, what we began to see then as a trend that has continued, because we now had medical technology that was not only life-saving but could be death-prolonging, because that we had these incredibly unprecedented medical advances, we wind up seeing about one-fifth of all health care costs being spent in the last six months of life. And this is not mostly life-saving. This is almost all a continued focus on finding a fix and a cure in the face of inevitable dying. Because we can't let go. Remember paradox one? Paradox, we just can't, can't let go. And then the other thing I want you to think about as we now look more explicitly on how did these footsteps then become more, more clear. Think of 1967 um, uh, and think of tonight. Is there anybody in the room who does not have a cell phone, iPad, iPhone? Is there anyone in the room who does not have one? Oh my Lord, you Luddites. <laughs> this is an important consideration because medicine is affected by culture and culture affects medicine. That is the larger culture. These are not distinct. Anybody here in the last week seen a child under six playing with a computer? Uh-huh, right. This, this has become normal and natural. You walk down the street, it's like impossible to see teenagers doing anything other than what I want you to understand now is that the experience that we're seeing is that technology, not just in medicine, but in the world we find ourselves, has become very common. Any of you ever see the movie Her? <laughs> this is a, what's the name of the, 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 the computer that you talk to that gives you the instructions? Siri. Siri. It's a Siri-like figure, and the man falls in love with the computer. There's another movie, it's called Transcendence. Huh? A neuroscientist and a computer whiz dealing in the issue of neurobiology. He's dying of a terminal illness. They decide to use the technology to upload his brain 
so that after his death, he achieves transcendence. You, what, those are just two movies. What you see in popular art, in theater, movies, these things, are, re are reflecting what we think. So technology, again, some of you are old enough here, especially some of the clergy persons would remember this. When the good rules in Catholic moral theology, I'm not talking about you, Bishop Mancini, I'm talking about others, he's <laughs> laughing at me. He's not a fan of the formal moral approaches. But you know this, ordinary versus extraordinary treatment. Do you remember that? How helpful that was when the technology was developing and you do a little re reflection and, well, is it ordinary? Because if it's ordinary, then you have an obligation because your life is precious, a gift of God to take care of it. But if it's extraordinary, then you don't have to use it. Well, let me tell you what happened. Within about 10 years of the use of that language, since the 60s, we had to stop using it because we meant morally ordinary or extraordinary. Not, is a ventilator extraordinary? Because now everybody knows what a ventilator looks like. You can't watch television. You can't watch one night, four straight hours, without seeing somebody on a ventilator. Somebody going in and out of surgery, robotic surgery. So what I need you to understand is that what, when we ask, where do we get from where we were to where we are, these general themes become important. You want to see it even more explicitly? This is medicine in 1967. This is a Time Magazine cover called The Last Family Physician in America. I got a little black bag like that. I was going to bring it tonight just for the heck of it. OK, I put my sewing stuff in it because I don't practice. My mom and dad gave it to me for graduation, right? But this is what I want you to hold on to now when we go from there to here. This little doctor making a house call, tramping through the field. <laughs> In his little black box was carrying everything that was medical technology. And it had been that way for 2,400 years, more or less. A little more things added to the bag a little fewer, a little surgical, kind of rudimentary surgical stuff. But what we're talking about, slight pedagogic exaggeration to make the point, this little bag really, until we moved to the 1960s, was what it was. Moreover, moreover, this was a foundational teaching in medicine, okay? It wasn't just what the doctor carried in the bag that helped him make a diagnosis and treat. It was the doctor himself. I still remember being told, well, if you want to know if a baby has CF, you've got to lick them. <laughs> uh, you want to know if the person has diabetes, you know what you've got to do with their pee. What, what, you need to understand this. The, the stethoscope, when you learned it, the doctor was physically connected. The, the, the doctor physically was entering into the patient's experience not, not just with the machines, like, I mean, blood tests were important, but what has happened then is from this time, again, circa 1960, but this is the way it was in less than 10 years. Unprecedented medical advances. So the things a few years before the cardiac transplant and up to the end of the 60s, in less than a decade, in less than a decade, the portable ventilator, not the big iron lung, that's the other famous Sister Kenny, polio nurse in Australia. The portable ventilator, effective cardiopulmonary resuscitation, hold effective, antibiotics, and the science of immunology which allowed organ transplantation. Dead is not dead anymore. Your organ dies, hey, we'll replace the function, that was dialysis then that doesn't work anymore, we'll get you another one. If you have a long wait to get another one, we'll give you a mechanical one. Dead is not dead. If one of you, please do not do this for dramatic effect, dropped down dead here today, what would you expect? Okay, I know I got two docs who'd help me. One, you, John, you'd help me, where's the other, my other doc? Okay, you would expect us, you would expect us 
to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and you would expect, whoop, they hop back up again. All right, and we'll go on with the lecture. Because that's what you see on TV. That's what you see on TV. Cardiac arrest, with cold blue, cold blue, flash, flash, red, red, the electricity. Blast them again. Everybody stand back, stand back. And then at the end of the show, half hour, hour most, the patient is in fact perfectly well and going home. That ain't the way it is. Even the best in an observed cardiac arrest in a hospital has outcomes that are exceedingly poor. But what I want you to understand is all of these things coming together really have created a situation of dead's not dead. You want me to prove it? The do not resuscitate order. I have a lecture called DNDNR. Do not, do not resuscitate. How in the name of all that's good and holy did it become necessary to write an order not to do something to a patient? You go to hospital for the dinkiest little thing, I have to write a prescription. What has happened is it's turned medicine on its head. Why? Because the assumption is if you do drop down, the technology will bring you back, and therefore we're obliged to use it. Good grief. Those of you who do chaplaincy, those of you who are in long-term palliative hospice, long-term care, you know the situations of people who are brought from a long-term care facility, for example, or their home. Unobserved cardiac arrest. Brought to the emergency department, have no advanced care plan, no one speaking for them, and what do the ER docs do? They resuscitate them. Why? Because the ethos unless directed otherwise, is if there's any possible hope of cure, that you act to preserve life. Even if the person is in palliative care, even if the person has clearly made an advanced care plan. Why? Because what has happened to our mindset, you, you, you get, get your mind around this. We have to say, don't resuscitate. Even it, It's the opposite of every other treatment where we have to ask permission for the procedure. And let me give you this one. The movie that we saw, Wit with Emma Thompson, showed, for those of you who were there, <laughs> exactly this. A woman who had a hard, uh, John Dunn scholar, very private intellectual, very highly prized her intellectual capacity, dying, dying. Very, very, very sad, uh, compelling movie. She doesn't want cardiac arrest. She has a wonderful nurse who helps her make that decision. It's written. But when, in fact, she goes into cardiac arrest in the hospital, the young resident who's a researcher who's there calls the code. And the, the nurse, it's the, 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 the nurse who's the heroine standing there saying, she doesn't want this, she doesn't want this. So we just saw a movie that typifies all too frequently. Medicine has become overwhelmed by its technology. Please understand, I'm a doctor. I love when machines do things well, but I'm not a boys with toys girl. It's not the machine that's most important to me. The machine is a good only insofar as it helps the individual to be healed or cured. Now let me end this with uh, this section with uh, I told you dying has changed. People expect now you can get a technology. Dead's not dead anymore. Go to the right hospital with the right doctor and the right piece of equipment and you too can defy death. The definition of dead is not what it was anymore. Did you know that? I went, the first time I gave this lecture, all I could think of was my good Irish grandmother, matriarch, widowed in Ireland, brought all her kids over. She was like bigger than life for me. I can hear Nana saying, no, glory be to God, darling, you mean you give a three-hour seminar on dead? <laughs> dead is dead, Anula, dead is dead, darling. No, Nana, I'm sorry. <laughs> but dead is not dead anymore. It just, I, I'm trying to get you to understand I'm not making up <laughs> the power of the transformation. This is what I mean. Dead was dead. Nana could know I was dead because Nana knew either my heart stopped and I stopped breathing or I stopped breathing and my heart stopped. So what did they do? Take out the little mirror and no, nothing's coming. Nula's dead. Nana could diagnose dead. Not anymore. 
Now you have to have brain death. You have to have the cessation of higher brain function in order to be declared dead. Now, some of you in the room may say, oh, isn't that, this is, this is actually quite insightful because that's higher function. Uh-uh. The main reason we changed from death of heart and lung to brain death is because we wanted the organs. I can show you the literature. I can show you the literature. This is why we did it. This is why we did it. Because now we had machines that could keep the heart going. We could keep resuscitating. We could, and we had a portable ventilator that could keep all the organs oxygenated while we went busy about trying to get the, the, the recipient of donated organs. So we had to keep them alive. Now, what I'm trying to get at for you in these examples so I can move on is when I say the power of science and technology, that the dying process has changed in large part internal to medicine because of the profundity of these medical advances. Now remember, they were, they were supported and encouraged from outside by a whole bunch of things that were happening socially. So what did we have? We have the specialization of medicine. So the, a doctor in charge of the heart can be the doctor who's different from the one that's in charge of your arthritis, who's different again from the one that's in charge of your eyes. Right? The role of the family doctor can be reduced to nothing much if you have one. So that specialization again moves you toward, think of the, the organ that you have to pay attention to, not the person. The medicalization of all aspects of life, well, uh huh. I would be very surprised if I can't find, if I could find anybody in this room who hasn't popped pills, I don't mean illegal ones, in the last 24 hours. We now have pills for every, okay, one person. <laughs> you've, you've been blessed and you're also disciplined. We medicalize every aspect of human life. We have a specialty of medicine that can tell you how to make sex, make babies, raise babies, deal with adolescence, uh, deal with bereavement at breakup of marriage, deal with dying, everything. And we got a pill for everything as well. Okay? And even in the movement towards disease prevention and promotion, it's not watch what you put in your mouth, exercise, and try to maintain good spiritual re relations with your loved ones. No, 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 no. I'll give you a pill for that, and I'll give you a pill for that, and we'll do a little procedure for that. So the life around us, specialized, medicalized, technical fix over care. I've had more than one person say to me, after a long time getting a, uh, to, a, to a hospital, uh, to a specialist, Nulu had all that weight and she didn't do anything. And you know what they mean? She didn't send you to another specialist. She didn't send you for an ultrasound and she didn't write you a prescription. And you said she didn't do anything because it's the, tech, it's the intervention that has now become the care. Moreover, the focus on patient over person, tomorrow when we look at palliative care in depth uh, and challenges to the caring community uh, about suffering and causes of suffering, we'll pay attention to this. And bioethics, this comes from the United States, um, where I was born, um, replaces it, medical morality. That's a lecture of its own, uh, which I've given to my colleagues in medicine. I'm so sad that doctors agreed to be the agents of death. So, I'm saying the technological has been advancing exponentially in medicine. Though I want to leave you with a sobering thought as we move on from this area. Most technologies are only halfway technologies. They don't get you from sick to all well. <laughs> Give me the best example, insulin. It's a technology, wonderful one. Huh? Banting and Best, Canadian discovery. You know what it did? It transformed diabetes to be an acute disease where you die from pancreatic insufficiency to being a long-term disease with vascular complications. Halfway technology. And by the way, that's what most of medicine is despite our belief. Now at the same time, moving in the direction of where did we come from, where did we go, the decline and rejection of religion in public life, 
the incredible rise of individualism, choice, and control. Many people believe that in Canada today, the only value, the only value for many is that of choice, individual choice. And then the misunderstanding in medicine that respecting patient autonomy means giving them what they want. Doctors become nothing more than glorified retail clerks. You don't come to me and say, Dr. Kenny, I want one of these, I'd like this test on Friday, and I want two of these, but that's what medicine has become. So now we come to the issue of assisted death and some of the challenges that we might be facing. First, you need to know that in terms of the footsteps, if you look legally at this issue, so there's been transformation in medicine, rise of the technical, decline of the spiritual, more and more separation of the care of the spiritual from the care of the physical. And then in law, since 1993 and the Sue Rodriguez case in Montreal, there has been an inexorable movement that some countries in the Benelux countries in Western Europe have legalized this, the state of Oregon has, and now there are I think, six other states in the United States, but an inexorable movement in Canada. A committed group of people whose strategy has been brilliant, focused first on legislation, there was some private members' bills, legislation failed. Then they got the brilliant idea to use the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. You do realize, if you look at legal cases, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, I, I have a co legal colleague who's expert on this, she can't find a case where the Charter held for the common good and limited individual rights. Nor did it here, nor did it here. It always moved to the protection of individual rights. And then the Supreme Court decision, which was based on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms channel, legalizes physician-assisted death. You need to understand this, this, this is important. There's only one other, one of the small Benelux countries, I'm blanking on it at the moment, that changed physician-assisted death by way of a ju judicial decision, not legislation. So since last February, there's been all this stuff trying to legislate and regulate who does this, who's eligible, are the mentally ill eligible, are we going to protect the vulnerable, et cetera. And we're still waiting what's going to be in Bill C-14. There's no... My work on this has been to try to protect freedom of conscience and to protect the vulnerable. And I'm not sure at all that in three weeks' time either is going to happen. So for the dominance of the technological, including a technological response even to human suffering, because that's what medicalization is. Some people have said to me, Nula, it's Jean-Luc Picard as part of the Borg, for those of you who are not Trekkies, you <laughs> poor things. Resistance is futile. Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic. I think there is always prophetic resistance. So if there are big footsteps going that way, yeah, little lighty, it's a tiny but powerful footprints, a little less sophisticated going in the other direction. So let me just say this very rapidly. Early on in this, as we move through this stuff, we saw philosophers and theologians, and there's a whole host I could do, a whole host I could do, trying to get at what were we doing by this capitulation to the technological. I'll do Paul Ramsey first. Paul was a Methodist, I believe, right? Paul Ramsey was a Methodist. And Dan Callahan, who was Catholic, uh, but founded the, the Hastings Center. And Paul Ramsey began to try to look at the depersonalization of medicine that was occurring with technology. And Dan Callahan's The Troubled Dream, Dream of Life was trying to look at what were we doing, particularly at end of life, this huge expenditures trying to be death-defying. Catholic moral theologians in particular, there's also a Judaic tradition I know of and some, some of the other traditions here. Catholic moral theologians were trying to figure out how do you make decisions that assume an obligation to care for the body but take into account the needs of others and the common good because the biologic good is not the only good there is. Then there were some physicians including Edmund Pellegrino, my mentor at Georgetown for my fellowship at the Kennedy Institute who wrote the book on the goals of medicine. Ed and his colleagues were trying to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Medicine is now doing things that have nothing to do with the original goals of medicine. Best example there, cosmetic, cosmetic 
plastic surgery. What in the name of all that's good and holy is a doctor trained with the incredible technical skills of plastic surgery who does wonders with a burn victim or a baby born with facial deformities? I mean, the highest of the art and science of medicine spending their lives doing boob jobs and nips and tucks. Do you know that there's, there's a crisis in family medicine with the number of family medicine docs who are now doing these cosmetic clinics because they can do it nine to five, make a lot of money, never have night call. Pellegrino was concerned about the goals of medicine. Then we've got two fellas. Eric Cassell writes the first book ever on the nature of suffering and the goals of medicine. He's trying to distinguish between suffering and the role of medicine in suffering. And Arthur Kleinman, Arthur Kleinman does this phenomenal book called The Illness Narratives, where he writes about the difference between the doctor's focus on disease and the patient's experience of illness. Big challenge that we have, as I move to the end here now, we do not know how to differentiate pain and suffering. So I want you to think about the example I want us to pay attention to. And I want you to remember, I want you to remember that the Supreme Court says it's about suffering. So just, and tomorrow we're going to explore this in detail. I want to say this to you. If you have chest pain, my colleagues in medicine have a lot they can do for you. Still not perfect, no guarantees. Medicine is about promises, not guarantees. But if you got chest pain, we got stuff for you. If you have heartache, what expertise does a doctor have? Duh. If you really understand heartache, because your son is prostituting himself on the streets of Vancouver, right? But whatever, for whatever the reason, remember this. Most human suffering has nothing to do with physical reality. And many people with great pain and people who are dying have no suffering. So part of what's happened to us as we've moved through this transition from there, a worldview of the normal and natural, the body and soul, the role of the family and community, is I, I'm not a Luddite. I think it's wonderful when technology can do good things, but when technology becomes the treatment, and when it then begins to think that it's not only about pain or other physical symptoms, but it is about human suffering, now we've got a problem. One of the most important voices of prophetic resistance to all of this has been the palliative care movement. So as I end now, I just want to remind you of this because one of the crucial things for all of us, whether you believe or not that persons should have medical assisted death to relieve their suffering as a compassionate th thing, you, you need to understand, I think, that it would be beyond conscionable that someone would choose assisted death because they did not have access to care that dealt with their suffering. It would be unconscionable to not have adequate, and these are some of the safeguards that I and others are trying to put into Bill C-14. You should have a mandatory palliative care consultation as a minimum before you would move. I think you would all agree that if somebody would choose to end their life because of the suffering, simply because no one paid attention to the suffering and even attempted to respond, that would be egregious in the extreme. So let's just get clear. Palliative care's movement, it's a that's Cecily Saunders' original movement, was in fact prophetic resistance against the overwhelming of technology. And the philosophy of palliative care was it neither hastens nor prolongs death. That's the World Health Organization definition of palliative care. Palliative care balances pain and symptom control with fullest participation in the last things. Palliative care at its best, those of you who are in it, those of you who have received it, it's, it is a return 
to the way the monasteries dealt with care of the body and care of the soul. Cecily, Cecily Saunders at Balfour Mount then, the pioneer here in Canada, they wanted the approach of palliative care to transform all of medicine. They just started with care of the dying because that was the place needed it most. And thirdly, palliative care focuses not just on the patient. This is not cardiac failure in room 22. This is Mary Smith and her handicapped son and her, her, her dying uh, uncle. Th this is the person and their loved ones because we do not die alone. And if we die alone, that, I believe, is the worst suffering you can have. So palliative care, let's get clear, is contradictory to physician-assisted death, not complementary, despite what you hear. So I think all of us need to be promoters of this prophetic resistance, not only to inappropriate technology, but to failure to care for the total patient that's represented in palliative care. Just rapidly, look at this. I've got a review of the literature. We're doing this in depth tomorrow. Why do people ask for palliative care? And the, the review was accepted uh, by the Supreme Court. A feeling of loss of dignity, feelings of dependence, the anathema to uh, modern sense of freedom, choice, and control, the guilt of being a burden to those whom you love, uncertainty regarding the future, and uncertainty regarding who's going to care for your needs. And then finally, loss of control and hopelessness. I want you to look at this because they are issues of human suffering. What I'm asking you to consider is whether or not a medical, technical response is the proper one. So Bill C-14, though God knows what it's going to be like. I mean, it's such a short period of time. So I can't, even the folks I know inside, we don't know what's going to be in there. And it's less than three weeks away. I have no idea what the province of Nova Scotia is going to do, particularly on the question of conscientious objection. You do realize this may mean for many persons of faith, Christians and others, and many palliative care providers, that they will be not protected when they refuse to participate in a request for assisted death. This is big stuff. So Bill C-14 is an opportunity for us to reclaim, rethink, an art of dying for today. Our world is not the medieval world. We're far apart. We've got family members all over the place. Technology is there. It does do wonders. But what can we do? How can we begin to rethink the prophetic resistance to the inappropriate use of technology? How can we think and act to resist the medicalization of suffering? Suffering requires a human, spiritual, emotional, communal response. How can we restore the moral meaning of illness? Because loss of meaning is one of the cl clear issues in the sense of loss of dignity. And how can we actively, practically promote and improve palliative care? For those of you who are Christians in the room, an AST is founded by three Christian traditions. I just want to say to you, for me, I think that Jesus himself, in his suffering and death, was teaching us the art of dying. And I think we've lost contact with some of that uh, notion. So from the secular, pull together with others perspective, recognizing the consequences of technical responses to suffering and advancing and promoting palliative care properly understood is a common event that should bring all of us together. But for those within the Christian tradition, and we're going to plumb this a little bit at the end tomorrow, um, the way I say it is this. If there was anyone in human history who could have gotten a do not stop at suffering card before he died, it would have been Jesus himself, and he did not. 
So what that challenged us to, not just Christians, not just Christians, but it returns us to plumbing the mystery of suffering is at the heart of all this because suffering is so wrapped up in sickness and in death. There are huge challenges, but prophets never had an easy time. Thanks. <laughs>